This morning, we're continuing our study in the book of Genesis, and uh, we have gotten to Genesis chapter 6, which uh, may be one of the most perplexing and difficult passages in the entire Bible. I'm not sure, but it just might be. So we've got some challenging verses to look at this morning, so let's just go ahead and dig right into the passage. Uh, I want to invite you to stand with me one more time, if you're able, uh, for the reading of God's Word. I'll be reading Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 22. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. This is the Word of the Lord. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh which is, which is the, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing, of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come in to keep to you to keep them alive. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Will you join with me in prayer? Father, it is difficult for us to read some of this passage. To hear you say that you were sorry that you had created man. So sorry that you would blot them out from the face of the land. So much so that you would make an end of all flesh. Father, we, we struggle sometimes even to understand it. Lord, we, we know that an unbeliever might look at this and say, of course God cannot be real. And even the faithful sometimes might read these words and might question your mercy, your grace, and your love. So, Father, we ask for help from your spirit today. Father, we pray that you would, would fill up in us what is, what is lacking in our hearts, and in my feeble words. Father, we know that this is your word. We want to understand it rightly. So we submit ourselves to you today. We ask that you would reveal yourself in your word. Oh, Lord, give us, give us a glimpse of your heart this morning. Have your way with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. 
So we're going to take a look at three points. No surprise there. And they all happen to start with C once again. Corruption, condemnation, and covenant. If you've been with us uh, over the last several weeks and months, you know we've been going through the book of Genesis uh, from the very beginning. And the last two weeks, we've had the wonderful joy of taking a look at uh, two different genealogies. Uh, now, I know a lot of preachers tend to stay away from genealogies, but we went through them anyway. Uh, and I believe that the Spirit of God wanted them there in Scripture for a reason. So we've taken a look at them. One of the benefits of having gone through those two genealogies in Genesis 4 and in Genesis 5 is that I think it helps us to have a little bit better understanding of what's going on in Genesis 6 now that we've gotten there. And of course, anytime anyone brings up the beginning of Genesis 6, the, the big question that comes up right away that everyone asks is, who are these Nephilim? Who are these strange people? And of course, if you just started reading the book of Genesis right here in chapter 6, if especially if you skip the last two chapters, then you could come up with all kinds of things. Um, but one of one of the most common answers that that people often come up with with uh, for for who the Nephilim are is that they must have been fallen angels or or a race of giants or maybe even the offspring of fallen angels who who became giants. Have you heard that before? Um, it's a lot of people have have said that about the Nephilim. Um, it's a common view that some Bible teachers put forward about these people in Genesis 6. Uh, the idea for angels comes from thinking that when it says the sons of God here, uh, that, that, those, that that meant angels. Uh, and somehow they think that these angels made it with human women to create this strange half-breed called Nephilim. Well, the word Nephilim is used in one other place in the Old Testament, and that's in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. Uh, Numbers 13 is the passage where Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land to, to go and check it out. And, and when the spies came back to, to the Israelites, Caleb and Joshua, two good names, Caleb and Joshua said, it's a good land, and the Lord is able to deliver that land to us. But but the rest of the spies said, no, we can't take that land. Nephilim live there. They're tall. We seem like grasshoppers compared to them. And that's the only other place that Nephilim is used in Scripture. So some have taken that word Nephilim to mean a race of giants. I do think, though, that there's a little bit of a difficulty with this understanding of the word Nephilim. Uh, first of all, if this is the same race of, of human fallen angel half-breeds showing up in numbers, I have to ask, how did they survive the flood? Genesis is clear that, that no one survived, no one but Noah and his family. They can't be directly descended from anyone but Noah. Secondly, uh, the idea of, of angels here here being called sons of God, they, so, they, so they say, uh, the idea of, of angels mating with human beings strains credulity. I, I don't think it's very probable. Uh, what we know about angels from the rest of Scripture just doesn't seem to fit with a picture of angels or those described as sons of God here as having relations with, with human women. Uh, the Nephilim are not a people who walk with God. Uh, nothing else in Scripture could lead anyone to think that that faithful angels, those who are servants of God, would reproduce some kind of illegitimate children who would oppose God. Even if they were fallen angels to begin with, I, I don't believe that Moses would have called them sons of God. There's nowhere in Scripture where I've seen fallen angels called sons of God. So that leads us back to the question, what are these Nephilim? Who are they? What are they? Well, this is where I think our understanding of Genesis 4 and 5 can really help us. In Genesis 4, we saw the line of Cain. Uh, remember, we saw these violent men who had fallen away from the Lord. The line of Cain began in murder and it ended in murder. But then in Genesis 5, we saw the line of Seth. These men who called upon the name of the Lord and walked with the Lord. 
men who continued to hold out hope for the promise of God to deliver them from the curse. And so in the context of knowing about these two parallel lines of descendants of Adam, one that walked with God and one that did not walk with God, Genesis 6, I think, makes a little bit more sense. I believe that the the sons of God here in Genesis 6 are are those from the godly line of Seth in Genesis 5. And the daughters of men come from the line of Cain from Genesis 4. So I think that what we're seeing here in Genesis 6 is that the line of Seth, the, the sons of God who walked with the Lord and called on his name, some of their children were marrying from the line of Cain. And this was not pleasing to God. He said in verse 3, my spirit shall not abide in or contend with man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Now, some might translate this as saying that people are going to start living shorter lives. Remember last week we saw those in Seth's line lived over 900 years. But I don't think that's necessarily what God is saying here. I think that verse 3 was actually a warning to people at that time. Do not be lured away from God by marrying outside of faith. The Spirit of God would not continue to abide or contend with men forever. That Hebrew word for abide there also means debate. There would be a judgment coming in 120 years. I believe that's what verse 3 is saying. Friends, there was a a growing corruption in the time before the flood, and the Nephilim are evidence of that corruption. Well, how do I know that that's what the the Nephilim are? Well, the very name Nephilim means fallen ones. Nephilim is an English transliteration of a Hebrew word. The root word for Nephilim is the Hebrew word Nephil. It means to fall. It could mean to fall, to fall down, to be inferior to, or even to fall upon. None of these were a good thing. When we see this word Nephilim in Scripture, it means either people who have fallen away from God or people who would fall on others in violence and in brutality. And I think we see both of those here in Genesis 6. At the end of verse 4, it describes them as mighty men of old men of renown. And if we didn't know any better, we might think that this was a good thing. But I think the rest of this chapter is making it clear to us that it's not a good thing. The very next verse says to us, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that verse is not excluding the Nephilim, these these mighty men of renown. They're included in that. And I think especially so when we get to verses 11 and 12, it says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. All the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. And in this backdrop of the earth, the Nephilim were the famous and the most mighty men of all. You know, fiction writers, uh, Hollywood screenwriters, they have come up with lots of these post-apocalyptic movies and and books and fantasy stories, everything from Mad Max to The Hunger Games, uh, all these stories about how human civilization, after some kind of great tragedy, may someday come crashing down and that the world will become a much more violent, brutal place, and only the strongest, only the mightiest of all would survive something like that. But the ironic thing here is that the Bible is actually telling us that the opposite story is true. It was before the apocalypse of the flood that the earth was so incredibly wicked and violent. It was before the flood that the mightiest men of all were the ones that ruled the world. It was the Nephilim, the mighty men of renown who dominated this world where every thought, every intention of the heart was only evil continually. Friends, there are some warnings for us in this passage. The sins that brought the great judgment of the flood, the the sins that grieved God to his heart in verse 6 are sins of pride, sins of power, and sins of violence. When we look at the sins of the line of Cain and see the brutality that's associated with these men, the Nephilim, the, the great sin that dominates this period is a hunger for power. 
It's a thirst for domination. It's a, it's a pride that says, we will have no God over us. We are the mighty ones. We saw Cain's jealousy end in the murder of his brother. And then his descendant, Lamech, murdered young men, maybe even children. And he threatened anyone who would get in his way, including his wives. And, and now we see what has happened, even from these children, these from the line of Seth. Those who had intermarried with Cain's line, and now their children have become the most infamous of them all. Can I take just a moment here to ask us, who is it that we look up to? Who is it that we look up to? In Genesis 6, the, the Nephilim were famous. They were the men of renown, the men of power. So many people stopped calling on the name of the Lord, and they started calling on the names of the Nephilim. Who do we look up to? Who do, we, who do we admire? Who is it that we think can really help us? Who is it that we really think can, can help the world? Is it a strong man of some kind? A mighty man, even a mighty woman, someone who, who says it like it is, no matter what the effect may be or who gets trampled on in the process. You know, about a year ago, uh, one of my sons asked me if I ever heard of a guy named Andrew Tate. I had no idea what or who he was, uh, but my son told me that there were, in his words, a lot of guys at Elizabethan High School who were following him on social media. And for those of us who, who don't really know who he is, Andrew Tate is a 36-year-old a British-American citizen and a world champion kickboxer, a very manly man. He also has millions of social media followers all over the world. I was looking online for some of his posts that, that I could share with you uh, to give you an idea of what he's like. But unfortunately, a lot of them were too vulgar to share uh, with you. Of course, that hasn't stopped millions of young men from following him. But, but here's one thing that I can share with you just to, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what he's like. He posted, I have everything every man has ever dreamed of. I got a big mansion. I got supercars. I can live anywhere I want. I got unlimited women. I go where I want. I do anything I want all the time. So I'm an amazing role model. Also, another post, he said, I will never apologize because I don't make mistakes. He is, in his own words, a self-proclaimed misogynist. In January... Andrew Tate and his brother were arrested in Romania on charges of organized crime and human trafficking. He's currently under house arrest. And young men in our community are still seeing his social media posts every day. A thirst for human power that denies the power of God leads into a spiral of violence. And sadly, I think if we, if we take a, an honest look at our own society, we have to recognize that we see increasing violence here in our own land. Friends, do you know what the greatest cause of death for American children between the ages of 1 and 19 was last year? It's gun-related violence, according to the CDC. As of 2019, according to the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the United States has the 32nd highest rate of violent gun deaths in the world. Now, 32nd might not sound that bad until you realize that there's over 200 nations in the world. We have eight times more murders than Canada. We have 100 times more than the United Kingdom. Our firearm-related death rate is right up there with Somalia. On Friday, I read that other Western European nations were warning their citizens about gun violence in the United States before they come to visit as tourists. The news of mass shootings has become so common, hasn't it? Uh, I remember two months ago, our family took a week of vacation over spring break, and we walked into the gym at the place where we were staying. My son and I walked into the gym on our first day of vacation, and I saw the news on television of the Nashville school shooting. Six people killed at a Christian school, a school attached to a PCA church. That's our denomination. Haley Scruggs, the pastor's nine-year-old daughter, shot dead in a Christian school. Friends, something is wrong. This is not a political statement. This is a heart statement. A society that has grown callous to violence done to its children, whether it be through abortion, predators, Drug abuse, yes, even gun violence, is a corrupt society. 
May God help us. In Genesis 6, God would not continually allow the corruption of mankind to run rampant on the earth. Condemnation, judgment was coming. Verse 7 reads, So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. In verse 13, God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so now we've come to the next perplexing part of this passage. God said that he will blot out man from the earth. That Hebrew word for blot out literally means to wipe clean. The same word is used in 2 Kings 21, 13, when, when the fall of Jerusalem is being prophesied. And God says, I will wipe Jerusalem like one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. You get the idea of wiping the earth totally clean, as though God would start the world over with a blank slate. And this is where a doubter and a skeptic might say, how could God do that? If God is still loving, how could he judge the world like that? If God knows everything, then why did he create the world anyway? If God ordains all things, then why ordain this? If God is all powerful, why allow sin to get so bad in the first place? Why? Why must God condemn mankind? I think there's at least three reasons, and probably more, but there's at least three reasons that are supported by Scripture and even by human logic. I'll try to keep these brief, but, but here are three of my reasons why, why I think God would condemn sin and bring judgment on the world. First of all, it's because he is just. God is just. Anyone who sees violence done to someone that they love can't help but long for justice. No one wants to live in a reality where, where a Hitler or, or a Stalin faces no consequence for their actions. Psalm 37 says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. It would be unjust for God not to condemn evil. If God did not condemn evil, he could not be good. A God who has no moral will for man, no moral law, that cannot be a loving God. Imagine a, a parent who, who doesn't care what happens to their child. Maybe their child gets bullied at school or maybe even kidnapped. Whatever parent, what, what kind of parent could possibly say, oh, whatever? I don't really even care. Of course not. Our God is just. Sin brings pain. It brings damage to the good world that God created. God's judgment seeks to restore goodness and to redeem what has been damaged. Secondly, God brings condemnation because life cannot continue apart from him. We know that God said in Genesis 2 that sinning against him would bring death. God didn't say this to Adam and Eve uh, as, as a threat, but, but as a loving warning from a good father. Repeatedly throughout scripture, God warns that his people, God warns his people that the consequence of turning away from him would be death and judgment. God created life itself. Life can only continue to be sustained in him and by his power. It will die apart from him. God has, God has no pleasure in the condemnation of sinners. He says in Ezekiel 18, 23, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord? And not rather that he should turn from his way and live. Remember that we said when we when we first started uh, going through the book of Genesis, all the way back to the beginning, uh, we, we said that God does not depend on anything that he has created. Rather, all of creation, all that we know of the world and the universe, all of it depends on God. So for a part of God's creation to say, I'm going to go and live my own life without God. It's like trying to build a house with no foundation. It just isn't going to be able to stand. It, it won't last. Life itself cannot continue indefinitely unless it is built on the foundation of a relationship with God. But thirdly, 
God allows condemnation and judgment because he is merciful and loving. God allows condemnation and judgment because he is merciful and loving. Now, I know in our minds, those two things may not may not seem to go together. They might seem like polar opposites. How can judgment be merciful? How can condemnation be loving? The judgment of God is merciful because even from the very first sin, God allowed the passage of time with the hope of repentance. God's condemnation is merciful because he gives time to repent. Remember that Old Testament creed, those words that, that we've heard many times, Exodus 34, 6. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Romans 2, 4 says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and his patience, knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you remember the passage on love in 1 Corinthians 13, that famous passage, love is patient, love is kind, love bears all things, love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Friends, do you realize that only an infinitely patient, loving, and merciful God could create a world in which his prized creation rebels against him And then he does not immediately annihilate them. Only a merciful and loving God could watch as as wickedness poisons his good creation and not immediately dispose of the source. Only a patient God could allow time for evildoers to repent. Friends, do you realize that, that God's judgment only exists because he continues to allow sinners to exist? All creation holds together by the word of his power. Our our God mercifully continues to allow this world to exist even as sin continues to grow. Why would he do that? Why, Why hasn't Jesus returned yet? Friends, it's because the harvest is not finished yet. There are more who will repent. There are more who will come to Jesus. You remember what Jesus said in John 6, 39. He said, this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Friends, that last day, that final condemnation of evil will not come until every last person who will repent does repent. Our God is incredibly merciful and slow to anger. You know, someone might say, well, that's all fine and good for this present age. But what about the people in Noah's time? The flood actually did come for them. Judgment did come and wipe them out. They received condemnation. Was God merciful then? Yes. Yes, he was, friends. We already saw in Genesis 6 today when God said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. There was 120 years to repent. They were given a timeline. They they knew that there would be a judgment coming. And we saw last week when we studied the genealogy of Seth that the flood did not come until every member of that line of Seth who knew the Lord had passed away naturally. Even old Methuselah, the oldest man to ever walk the face of the earth. He died in the year that the flood came. God gave people in Noah's day time to repent. They even had long lifespans to consider what they were doing. In fact, look at the age of Noah's father when he died. It's in Genesis 5.31. He was the last one of a line of Seth before the flood. Do you see how many years he lived? Do you see it? 777 years. Friends, when the number seven is used in scripture, it's clear that this is a sign of completion. This is a sign of perfection. The fact that the last lifespan given to us in Genesis 5 is 777 years is a sign to us that the time of mercy shown in the age before Noah was complete. Everyone before Noah who would repent already did repent. And so the time of judgment would come. 
But friends, the time of God's mercy to the line of Adam was still only just beginning. We're introduced here in Genesis chapter 6 to, to God's plan to redeem his good creation and to save those fallen sinners who still call on his name. Verse 9 says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then skipping down to verse 17, God says to Noah, For behold, I will bring a, bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, which is in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your son's wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. Noah was declared a righteous man who walked with God. He and his family were saved from the judgment by the mercy of God. And I've, got to, I've just got to remind you here that Noah was not a perfect man himself. And we'll see this more later when we get to Genesis 9, but, but we'll see that Noah got drunk and he cursed his grandson. He's not a model grandparent, but he wasn't saved because of his grandparenting skills. Hebrews 11:7 tells us, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah was saved by faith. Friends, I've got to ask you today, are you worried about the violence of our times? Are you troubled for your children and your grandchildren? Who are you looking to to save us? Who do we think is going to make the world better for our kids and our grandkids? Are we looking to the mighty men, the men of, of renown, or even the mighty women of renown? Are we, are we following the, the famous, the, the powerful people, hoping that somehow they will straighten everything out for us? Friends, Genesis 6 is showing us that all of the might, all of the power, all of the fame, all of the pride of mortal men will bring nothing but condemnation. There is only one thing that can save us, just as it saved Noah so long ago. It's the covenant promise of our covenant-keeping God. God told Noah in verse 18, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark. Friends, this is how God always interacts with people throughout history. He makes covenant promises, and he asks us to receive those promises by faith and walk with him. I know that word covenant may not be familiar to some. We'll talk about it more in the weeks to come, even as we talk more about Noah in the weeks to come. But, but for now, know that a covenant is God's unbreakable promise to redeem his people from judgment. And we accept that covenant by faith. Friends, this is, this is different from the way of the Nephilim. This is, this is different from the mighty and the powerful. They were the strong men. They were the famous. They were the ones who made a name for themselves so that everyone would fear them and respect them. In those days, if you wanted to survive, you had to become like them. But the covenant promise of God is the opposite of that. The way of, of life in God's covenant promise is not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. The covenant promise of God says that the mightiest one of all the very son of God would give up his power. He would become a nobody. He gave up his might and his fame, and he was born in a stable. Philippians 2 says that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The covenant promise of God says that the mightiest of all became nothing so that you and I could be redeemed by faith in him. Friends, if you're still struggling with the idea of God's judgment, then here is the final word from scripture about it. Jesus bore condemnation, judgment for you on the cross. We do not have a God who condemns from a distance, but we have one who would himself bear the very condemnation that our sins deserve. This is good news, friends. This is the covenant promise of God that we can accept by faith. Jesus Christ is the ark given for us to safely carry us through the flood of judgment. 
And by faith in Christ, we can now say, along with Paul in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friend, the gospel hope is available to you today. Come to Christ and rest in his covenant promise for you. You join with me in prayer. Father in heaven, what mercy, what love you have shown to unworthy sinners like us. Father, though the sin and turmoil swirls around us, violence still, your patience, your mercy endures. Still, you wait for every last man, woman, and child who would turn to you to repent of their sin and to claim your covenant promise. Spirit of God, help us this week to walk by faith and not by sight. Forgive us for the times when we have been lured away by, by power and might and fame of the world. And Lord, teach us to walk humbly with you. Oh, Lord, glorify yourself in us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing a final song by mercy, my God? Friends, please join us for lunch today. Please remember right through the door there and right up that way. And also don't forget about writing a note for Jake as well. Hear the Lord's blessing from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.